Ladies and gentlemen, the drill down of new Xbox hardware has been a tradition for Microsoft. And after the rather extensive rundown of the Xbox One console before its 2013 launch, I was very excited to see what, in turn, Microsoft would reveal about the Xbox Series X architecture. There are still some mysteries for the machine, but overall I feel that Microsoft have provided a pretty extensive insight into the inner workings of the system, particularly for the SOC and memory configurations for the Xbox Series X. There is a ton of information which Microsoft have provided here, so I want to go through these uh, slides and this information as a two-part series. And this is also an article, so you can check out the written format if you prefer. Largely, I'm using the article as a script of sorts. So once again, if you prefer the written uh, version of this, you can check it out, which is linked in the video description, or you can listen to this if you prefer. I would, however, suggest that uh, you don't just listen. You, at the very least, uh, look at key moments if I mention a specific slide, because otherwise you're not really going to understand what I'm referring to. Anyway, so let's start things out with the overview of the SOC itself. Microsoft called this really important slide the physical view, and it's what Microsoft have basically managed to jam into the confines of the silicon. The chip is made using TSMC's N7 enhanced process, but while folks did actually query Microsoft to what exactly this enhanced process was, as TSMC have several options. Microsoft declined to state exactly what the level of enhancement was. According to Anantec, uh, it was quoted as saying, it's not based in 7, it's progressed over time, that is in 7. And there's been lots of work between AMD and TSMC to hit the targets and what we need. And that was all they said. Anyway, the die itself measures 360.4 mm, which is identical actually in size to the Xbox One X die. The difference is though that that die was made using the 16 nm process, but this is of course 7. Well, that difference and it's also 15.3 billion transistors rather than the paltry 7 billion in the Xbox One X. We can also see the first hint of how the APU itself of the console is divided up. The GPU takes more than a significant portion of the overall die space. The GPU in this console is frankly massive and at the top and sides of it are GDDR6 memory controllers, which is 10 total. Of course, we also see various CPU cores too, which are in two clusters, four cores in each cluster. So, yup. Microsoft doubles down on the machines with a slide called SOC Specs, GPU, DRAM, and CPU. But, honestly, much of the stuff listed here doesn't really contradict to anything we already knew. There are, however, a few confirmations to several things which I'd guessed in several videos. For example, the size of the cache of the CPU for various clusters. Broadly speaking, the GPU is 1.825 GHz, 52 compute units, which equals to 3,328 streaming processors, shaders if you prefer, and this is about 12.1 TFLOPs, a touch over of raw FP32 performance, that's full precision operation. Microsoft have also provided a SOC diagram, and you can see the basics of how the APU communicates with different parts of itself, and of course how it in turn also talk, uh, talks to other parts of the system, for example, USBs or whatever. The Zen 2 core proudly state their cache, and once again, they also mention that they are separate dies. The Zen 2 cores positively crush the Jaguar CPU in the previous generation consoles, as seen in these benchmarks that I made. Here with these benchmarks, you can see that the 3700X with eight cores, 16 threads, aka SMT off, scores around 30,000 points with multi-core enabled. And this obviously demolishes any of the uh, previous generation consoles. The Jaguar, it's 2100 uh, megahertz and it scores 76 84 on Geekbench. You can also see that the multi-core scores too just crush it. So yes, the 3700X, which again is powered by eight of AMD's Zen 2 cores, does physically dominate Jaguar, and this does give you perhaps some insight into the CPU performance from one generation to the next. As I said, the CPU was manually clocked at 3.5 GHz for the highest end 
Ryzen tests. This was actually the rumored clock speeds that both next generation consoles would uh, be running at when I made the graphs. But anyway, I'm fairly happy with this. I think it still stands the test of time. Uh, it's only 100 megahertz slower than the Xbox One X, uh, sorry, Xbox Series X with SMT. Uh, enabled anyway and the xbox series x also has a smaller cache get into that in just a second so i think these results are relatively uh, still accurate honestly and yeah long story short the next generation cpus on both consoles absolutely demolish what we have with the current gen the CPU operates in two different modes, that is SMT enabled and disabled, and this does also affect clocks. This is 3.6 or 3.8 GHz with SMT on or off respectively. Microsoft confirmed in a Eurogame interview that for allocation, one CPU core is allocated to the OS, with the rest of course being for games. To be abundantly clear here, this is one core and both threads. These threads are likely to be locked to that core too. They won't jump around to different cores and different CCXs because what you don't want is for, let's say, some of the level 2 cache of a specific core being filled with operating system stuff. So, for example, if you had it running on two entirely different threads, you're basically filling up the uh, L2 cache of those cores with OS stuff, and this would also be sharing of game data, which would reduce performance. So Microsoft, I'm guessing this, they've not stated it implicitly, at least as far as I understand, but I'm guessing that they've hard-locked the cores um, just to OS functionality. It's not clear, however, how this functions with developers if um, SMT is disabled, because that's how developers can choose to run games. They can either run them with SMT enabled, or disabled. So unfortunately, I can't give you insight into how this OS allocation changes. Again, there's also 16 gigabytes of GDDR6 memory, with the fastest memory giving up 560 gigabytes per second bandwidth. That's the 10 gigabyte pool, and the low memory interleave is only 6 gigabytes. Microsoft also reaffirms various features of the system, such as sampler feedback streaming, which I've covered in a video previously, but I will go more extensively into in part two of this coverage. DirectX um, ray tracing, which again is Microsoft's branding and feature set for DirectX, in other words, the API. The hardware itself is AMD based, and we'll discuss it in further in just a moment. And we'll you know, also discuss variable rate shading, mesh shading, and a lot of the memory configuration more extensively in part two as well, because there's so much to digest with the CPU and GPU. So again, let's shift our focus back to the CPU, which, as I said a moment ago, is Zen 2 based with eight CPU cores. The Series X retains the 512 kilobytes of level two cache per core, which is the same as any other Zen 2 implementation, for example, Ryzen 3000 for the desktop, but the Xbox Series X cuts the amount of level 3 cache by a significant amount. It's one quarter the amount of, let's say, the 3700X. Honestly, this perfectly is in line with AMD's strategy with other APUs, and also, logically, it just makes sense. The Zen 2 processor die for 8 CPU cores and its accompanying level 3 cache uh, for the desktop, just to be really clear, um, is 74mm squared. You can see it on screen at the moment. And uh, there was a fellow YouTuber, I'll link his, um, his uh, die analysis in the video description if I remember. If not, it's linked in the article. But basically, you can see just how massive the portion is. So... What you're looking at essentially is the desktop um, eight cores with its level three cache being 74 mm ish in size, but each of the level three chunks, and there are two of them, they're separated for the desktop implementation of 17 mm squared, and the cores are only 2.87 mm. And of course, there are some other parts as well on the chip as well for to facilitate intercommunication and stuff. But long story short, the cache is the biggest portion of the desktop um, CCX. So it doesn't make sense for Microsoft to use this. Basically, they had to decide whether or not to trade the die space of the level 3 cache 
and they decided instead just to opt to save the die space for other things, such as more CCXs, or sorry, uh, more CUs on other components and logic on the APU. They could have obviously gone other routes, like they could have made the APU even bigger, but that's also increasing the risk of failure. Honestly, if I were Microsoft, I would have done much the same thing. I don't have benchmarks because obviously I can't just, uh, you know, use their OS stack and all of this stuff and then test out, um, uh, like, Xbox Series X builds and kind of sim them as Microsoft could. But I'm guessing that they felt that the risk of cache misses, that is, data not being present in one of the caches, and farming it out to um, GDDR6 was worth it to actually cram other stuff into the SOC. So, as I said, I think that this is uh, a good thing from Microsoft's perspective. They also confirmed that level 3 cache and two CPU for, uh, portions are essentially separate on the die. They are not unified. I mentioned in a PlayStation 5 exclusive that I think it might have unified L3 uh, cache, similar to what's found in the Zen 3 architecture, although, just to be abundantly clear, I don't think that anything else is Zen 3. I think that the rest of the functionality is Zen 2, but I am unsure about this. The purpose of a unified cache would be to reduce latency from accessing data which is held in another core's L3 cache. For example, Let's say that we have core 0 to 3, and the level 3 cache of that um, holds a piece of data that core 5 from another set of cores need to access. Essentially, if it's not unified, there's a larger latency penalty associated with grabbing this. This is exactly how Zen 2 works for the desktop, so this is not a knock on Microsoft. I just believe from what I'm told... Um, from a few people, Sony have opted to unify the cache, but I cannot be certain. So please do not take that as a guarantee. I've just been told it. I am not certain of it. Interestingly, and this I can't answer what exactly they mean, unfortunately, they are stating that it's server class, and uh, that is for the CPU core. And this is not true to many reasons, but they are insisting that it is, because when um, a journalist asked, it says Zen 2 is server class, but you're using the level 3 mobile class size. They said, yeah, our cache is different, but we can't say any more, it's AMD. So it seems like it's not just a stock Zen 2 desktop CPU. They have done something else, it's using a slightly different variant of cache, albeit it's smaller. Unfortunately, I have no idea what that is, and um, the statement is just not enlightening. As I said, the chips are definitely separate, the level one, the level 3 cache is smaller, but because Microsoft are not providing any extra insight, and AMD, to my knowledge, have not detailed what this is, I don't know. I'm spitballing, but it could be some uh, tweaks to improve latency, maybe data path size or something else entirely. I honestly don't know. It could just be, I don't know, like every every 300 instruction or something like that. It, it you know plays the stars and stripes. I honestly don't know. But anyway, that's uh, now we've got one of the big questions remaining for the Xbox Series X. Hopefully, we get that answered in the future. Let's scoot our way over to the GPU, which, as I mentioned earlier, is easily the largest component on the APU. The GPU portion of the Xbox Series X APU is just under 50% of the total die space, and it does contain 56 shader units, but four of these are disabled for yield purposes. Disabling uh, CUs for yield purposes is something that Microsoft and Sony have done with the previous generation. They disabled two for the Xbox One and PS4, and I believe I might be wrong, but I think it's four for the Pro consoles. Um, getting back to it, though, Microsoft are cranking these clock frequencies up to 1825 MHz, which again is about 12.1 TFLOPs. Not 12, it's 12.1. People are not actually uh, giving Microsoft the credit and it's 100 G flops, which is not a small amount. To put it into some level of context, 
you know, the previous generation consoles that is like the Xbox 360 and stuff, 240-ish G flops, I think, was the GPU floating point performance of those. So it's basically cheating Microsoft out of like a three six a half of a 360. Anyway, that's full that's full precision FP32 performance. Again, you cannot though, being you know serious for a moment, you cannot compare T flops from one gen of consoles to another. It's not fair at all to say that the Xbox Series X is only twice as powerful as the Xbox One X. RDNA 2 offers several generations of IPC instructions per clock improvement. And this also includes function and performance that FP32 cannot give you any insight into, including things like texture performance, uh, data compression on the GPU, and geometry performance, all of which is incredibly important for rendering games. In the GPU evolution slide, there's something very interesting here. Microsoft have actually indirectly confirmed that there are 64 ROPs for the Xbox Series X. This was long guessed by myself based on Arden leaks, uh, and these of course originated from GitHub. There were tons of stuff that were inaccurate for both the PlayStation 5 and the um, Xbox Series X, but I guessed that the number of ROPs was still 64. Some people were stating it was 80, but I just didn't guess so, because even cards like the uh, Radeon 7, which by the way, I was the first to leak the existence of, and also I leaked the renders of before its announcement. I also leaked, by the way, the release date of Ryzen 3000, as well as the first generation Narve, just so you know. But anyway, um, that only had 64 ROPs, and there were tons of other high-end GPUs from AMD which only has 64 ROPs. And AMD typically don't go with 80 um, ROPs. It's just not how the uh, architecture really comes together. So, and I'm I'm about to guess without um, any formal education on the actual, you know, full specs here of the Xbox Series X, uh, sorry, S. I did cover recently that it's about 40 flops, of course, in performance because... Um, there were a couple of leaks for the uh, GPU configuration. It's apparently running around just over 1500 megahertz and blah, blah, blah. There was no information on the number of ROPs. I don't think it would be 16. I think Microsoft would stick to 32 ROPs, but that is not a leak. That is a guess on my part for the Series S. Do wait for official confirmation. So you can actually check this figure yourself. That is the G pixels, because you may say, well, you know, I don't see it listed. Where Where is it listed that it's only got uh, 64 ROPs? And I, you know, I understand if you don't know how to do this measurement, but you can really easily do it. You take 1825, which is, of course, the GPU frequency that the Series X runs at, and then you multiply that by 64, and that, of course, would come to, a, you know, the figure that we're seeing here. So... Fill rate is what ROPs give you, so it's always the number of ROPs times, or multiply if you prefer, the clock frequency, and this is pretty consistent across different architectures, but it is worth noting the different GPUs are more or less efficient depending on the architecture, and tons of other stuff that's going on, you know, behind the scenes. This ROP figure, once again, to my understanding, is identical to the PlayStation 5, with obviously the clock frequencies differing. Moving on to the next slide, the GPU diagram, and this, I'm actually kind of surprised that Microsoft got AMD's go-ahead to reveal so much of the RDNA architecture. We don't even officially know how the desktop implementation of these GPUs are spec'd, so... I mean, it makes sense, I suppose, because NVIDIA at this point can't exactly change their design. I mean, we've just heard that uh, essentially they're starting to even ship and produce the GPUs. NVIDIA can't just be like, you know what, we're going to add like an extra, I don't know, like three or four SMs or, I don't know, I'm just making it up on the spot. I was kind of a fail. But my point is they can't really change the specs at this point anyway. They can adjust prices. So... I think AMD doing this and giving um, giving Microsoft permission to show so much 
is probably a way for AMD to basically get free hype for RDNA 2 because at the moment everyone in the PC space is just focusing on NVIDIA for Ampere. Papa Jensen is, you know, the person with all the eyes on him. Later this year it will be AMD and Lisa Sue of course when RDNA 2 is formally announced but for right now everyone's really excited for Ampere. But getting back to the Xbox, we can see it's still a dual compute unit design. This is pretty much what you saw with RDNA 1, but this is way better. Um, in this example, there are two inactive CU. You can see that they are darker on screen. These are not the ones that will always be inactive. So it could be you know, the first left, so the, the leftmost row, and then, you know, the second left row, or it could be, you know, the two on the right, or it could be the two in the middle, or whatever. It just depends on what of these, sorry, which of these is damaged from production, and even if it's not, I guess it's just two random ones. So even if you were lucky enough to get an Xbox with all of the CU working, they would still disable two for yield purposes, obviously. There's also a pretty significant amount of level 2 cache, and this is accessible via the shade engines and in turn the GPU. So each of these dual CUs contains two um, regular compute units. So obviously in this case, you would do um, 26, multiply that by 2, which gives you, uh, well, 52. Again, this level 2 cache is designed as a storage area which basically is for regularly accessed or still being used data and data which is being used in various you know registers or local compute units if it's not used for a while or maybe it you know is pre prefetched or whatever the level uh, 2 cache can hold it 5 megabytes might not sound much, especially if you were to compare it to 16 gigs of GDDR6 memory 1 gigabyte after all is 1024 megs but I can assure you it's a significant amount of memory to hold instructions and other data in. To put it into some level of context, if we pick on the Radeon 7 for a moment, which I want to stress is the Vega architecture, but it only had 4 megabytes of level 2 cache, and the RX 5700 XT, which only has 40 compute units admittedly, uh, Vega has uh, 64, but um, with the Radeon, uh, sorry, with the um, RX 5700 XT, it also only has 4 megabytes of uh, level 2 cache. But honestly, this is still a significant amount because the purpose of this is not for data residency for long periods of time. You know, we're not talking about the GPU holding this data for several minutes, basically. This is GPUs are designed for throughput, you know, to get data through the system as fast as possible. So, yeah, the purpose of the level 2 cache is basically a couple of things. One, it reduces the uh, stalls in the pipeline and latency if data um, is held within it. So it doesn't need to basically farm out to main system memory. And also doing this thrashes system bandwidth as well. Because obviously if it needs to keep kind of going out to a main system memory, you're eating up GPU bandwidth. Whereas you could just keep those frequently used instructions or data within the uh, GPU itself, which obviously is way more efficient. Anyway, um, on a more local level, each of the dual CU contains its own local data share for the uh, RDNA 2 based GPU. And the Xbox Series X, as you can see, holds two shader engines and each of these has two shader arrays so this actually i mean it's pretty obvious to see on screen because i've uh, annotated it for you but long story short um you can see that uh each at the very bottom there's like raster prim param raster prim a shader input and then obviously it's pretty much mirrored at the bottom so you know the two on the left, they are uh, shade engines, and then, you know, the ones with the dual CU with the L1 uh, dollar sign, which is cash, that basically is the uh, shade engine. So, sorry, shade array. 
So it's shader, uh, it's shader engine, which is subdivided into shader arrays. And then each of these arrays contain up to seven dual CU, which is 14 compute units in total. Once again, assuming there are no disabled portions on that GPU or that particular uh, array. The RDNA2 shader array also, also given its own level one cache, as I just mentioned, and this forms the three level hierarchy, which Microsoft described for the Xbox Series X GPU diagram. The level two cache, as I said earlier, is for the whole GPU. Then you have the level one cache for the shader array. And then you've also got local data shares for the dual CUs, which we'll look deeper at in just a second. Okay, so let's actually look deeper into the dual compute units. Now, looking inside them, you can say that each of the dual CUs contains four SIMD and four scalar ALUs. And notice, as we're looking inside the dual compute unit, you can see clearly that there are two compute units visible, each with their own SIMD32 ALUs and registers and other things which are mirrored. Also, on the left, you can see that the ray acceleration and texture mapping units are essentially shared slash slightly different and uh, separate blocks. We'll get into that in just a second. And these are on each of the CU. According to Microsoft during the lecture, we're looking at RDNA 2 featuring about a 25% in performance per clock increase from the previous generation, which again was RDNA 1. I think this is pretty impressive and honestly a testament to the engineering efforts over at AMD's Radeon Technology Groups. Let's go back though to the ray tracing. As I said, this was kind of like the biggest feature really, other than the SSD, for the next gen consoles. Microsoft have confirmed, of course, previously several times now that ray tracing was part of the Xbox Series X. And in an interview with Eurogamer, they also confirmed that for BVH calculations, bounding volume hierarchy, I'll get further into that in just a second, but basically it's the calculation of ray slash triangle intersection. Um, without RDNA2 ray tracing acceleration, uh, it would basically require an extra GPU, which would be about 13 teflops in performance. To be clear, this is basically what Pascal comments from NVIDIA, you know, previously, where they basically said that to do this in software, i.e. not to have any dedicated hardware, you would need about 13 teflops. NVIDIA were keen to point out that Pascal gets absolutely like demolished if it's trying to run these on software without dedicated RT units to accelerate them, and that's basically the same statement that Microsoft were making. In this specific slide, DirectX Ray Tracing Acceleration, custom ray trace, we'll get into that in a second, 380G, uh, G uh, slash sec ray box peak and 95G ray tri peak. Net performance depends on bandwidth, number of nodes, traversals, visits per ray. The shader can run in parallel for BVH traversal, material shading, and the area cost is minor with 3 to 10 times the acceleration. So, intersection testing, of course, is not the only step in hardware based ray, uh, ray tracing. With BVH or another method, the scene basically has rays shot into it, um, and then these rays calculate if a light source, for example, interacts with a visible portion or a visible object, excuse me, on screen, and then in turn, if this bounces to another source, Microsoft clearly point out 380G slash sec for a ray box with only 95G for a triangle. To put it in slightly different slightly different words, these figures are considerably lower for a scene which you could say is more representative of a game. And also, please realise that this 380 figure is not dwarfing the 10 giga rays figure from NVIDIA and say the RTX 2080 Ti, they are measuring very different things. With AMD's figure, aka what Microsoft are providing, it measures AA, uh, BB traversals and intersections. The thing is though, it takes tons of different intersections, triangle intersections, to have anything meaningful as a ray. And that is basically what NVIDIA are calculating with giga rays. This is not just a case where measurements are different, but they also are likely to change on a per scene basis. Uh, for example, what is the method of uh, BVH which is used? Slightly different algorithms, and we're unsure of some of this stuff as well. 
which makes it even harder to calculate. To put this in a very simple layman's perspective, just think of it like you're trying to give someone the temperature, and you work in Fahrenheit, and they work in Celsius, but imagine you don't know what the conversion for F to C was, you can't just look online, and let's say that someone gave you a data point, let's say someone did tell you a data point, but then the moment you started to figure out that data point, the measurement would change because the scene would change. That's kind of what I'm saying. That's not to say that um, Xbox did wrong providing these calculations. It's probably just how AMD internally are figuring this stuff out. And it will be much the same for the PlayStation as well, as they essentially use identical methods of ray tracing. To really understand how RDNA 2 compares to Turing or NVIDIA, um, and of course Ampere when it does launch, we need to run a game basically on a PC desktop GPU for both AMD and NVIDIA with approximately the same performance tier and see how the performance scales. And then we can get a better idea of how the two handle uh, ray tracing. Last year, there was also the hybrid ray tracing patent which surfaced. I actually leaked previously the existence of hardware-based ray tracing on the second generation of Narve, aka now of course RDNA 2, and then I covered extensively the patent, but in brief, what Microsoft are doing very much matches what we've actually seen in these patents. To keep things simple here, if you read again the slide dual compute unit, it makes it clear that we're looking at four texture or ray operations per um, CU. So to put things into, once again, a simpler method, there are four texture mapping units per compute unit for RDNA 2, which is, by the way, the same number of first texture mapping units as RDNA 1. So there are two active, two of these per dual CU. So of course, this basically means that you're looking at 208 texture mapping units you take 52 active for CU, and you multiply that by the 4 TMU. Uh, once again, we're not including the 4 deactivated CU because they don't do anything. You can get this figure then of either the number of intersections by multiplying the 208 TMU figure by the frequency of the GPU, and this also gives you the texture mapping performance as well. Again, Microsoft is stating the 380 figure is peak, with the number falling to just, it's still pretty impressive honestly, 95 for a complex scene. The net performance also depends on a number of things. For example, bandwidth for the number of nodes slash triangles visited per ray. So you might have this thing where rays don't have as much stuff to interact with in a specific level or scene compared to another one. Uh, designers can choose how many bounces a ray can have, but also think of this, in some scenes you will just have fewer reflective surfaces, and others, like a hall of mirrors or something like that, you know, good luck. Notice though that it says that the shaders can run simultaneous to the BVH calculations, so that the GPU is not just sitting idle while ray tracing is occurring. This is somewhat similar to what Cerny said in the Road to PlayStation 5 event. You can check it out at literally the 30 minute mark. But it does seem though that Microsoft and Sony have done some tweaks to their GPU with the ray tracing. Microsoft are telling us that there's custom ray box slash triangle units but it doesn't really mention much because this is exactly how the patent was filed for AMD. Um, so it's kind of interesting that uh, we have this because Microsoft doesn't give us any real insight into how they've tweaked it. It may be something slightly different. It may be just like some instructions that have added specific for DirectX ray tracing once again, I'm not certain. But to what we understand from the Hot Chimps conference, as well as the uh, AMD patent, basically the GPU shaders provide the TMU an instruction. This is written in a texture format, and this provides both ray data as well as points, which points to the BVH node in the tree. Basically, whereabouts in the BVH tree data goes.
And then in turn, this, inf this information is processed by the TMU and then the rate intersection engine, which again, you can see in the dual CU block diagram, gets fed this raw data so it can basically decide how to continue operation by performing tests. Then the shady units receive the result of what's calculated and then in the next node, it can figure out which one to tackle, which node, excuse me, to tackle in the BVH tree. And again, I'll point you to the bunny rabbit from NVIDIA. This basically is kind of a sorting algorithm, BVH, as I realized I didn't really explain it extensively. You can do a Google on this yourself, but basically it's pretty much trying to sort things into boxes and then subdivide those into further boxes and then further boxes from that. So it's pretty much trying to get an outline of the scene, what pixels are doing what, what pixels will, or should I say, uh, objects on screen, geometry, whatever, um, will be interacting with what, what light sources and other things. I also wanted to touch on compute because during the Digital Foundry interview, once again, I've linked it in the uh, article, but uh, Microsoft did state that upsampling was possible using machine learning for the Xbox Series X, and this is using lower precision operations, either 4 or 8-bit. Of course, the GPU can also handle half precision as well. 16-bit operations have precision aren't anything new. They were part of the Vega architecture, and before that, they were part of the PlayStation 4 Pro. RDNA 1, of course, supports them as well, but 4 and 8-bit operations are not new. Microsoft references machine learning interface acceleration under other tricks, but it uh, can also use them for more things than just upsampling. AI and physics are great examples of what it can do here, with essentially machine learning running on the GPU as inference. Inference is basically the act of running trained data on a GPU. It's computationally way less expensive and taxing to run trained data compared to actually like the machine learning itself. Microsoft specifically state that there's a small area cost associated with this, but doesn't implicitly state any custom hardware. Indeed, a lot of the RDNA 2 compute functionality is not touched in this specific drill down. And I do believe that the lower precision operations are part of RDNA's, um, RDNA 2's base functionality. Indeed, one of my earliest sources, if you've been watching the channel for a while, know that uh, I said multiple times that RDNA 2 was supposed to improve compute performance significantly or in different ways over RDNA 1. And honestly, having this kind of upsampling tech makes sense from a business perspective for AMD, given that NVIDIA are increasingly pushing tech such as DLSS2 as a marketing tool, though NVIDIA's technology does use GeForce's tensor cores to run, which doesn't take up shader time. AMD pushing a similar upsampling tech is not just logical, it needs it to stay competitive. On the PC space, monitors such as 1440p 120Hz are now super affordable, and even mid-range such budget screens go up to 165Hz 1440p. 4K is coming down in price, and it will continue to do so in the future. And DLSS allows games to upsample from 720 to 1440p, four times the pixels, and this also works from 1080 to 4K, again, four times the pixels. The benefit of this is not just for flagship cards pushing higher frame rates, but also for low to mid tier products as well, offering great value propositions. Since AMD pushed ray tracing, they also need to upsample too to stay competitive because ray tracing is just simply more taxing. I therefore think that even outside of my own information, which I am pretty damn confident in, I am believe that RDNA 2 as well as the PS5 has this, especially RDNA 2 because AMD just needs this for a business reason. Um, but let's now be really honest, there's still a ton left to go into with the Hot Chips conference, but this is already getting very lengthy. Um, the recording time for this is about 40 minutes, with a few screw-ups on my part, which will, of course, be cut out. But I do want to leave you with some conclusions, because there is still a ton more stuff to get through, and honestly, I think the stuff that I've not gotten to is probably as important.
Uh, we're going to be in the next part discussing more the memory configuration of the Xbox Series X, audio processing, things such as SFS, mesh shading, and lots of other stuff. But I do want to give, as I said, some conclusions, and they are this. The Hot Chips conference really shows that the Xbox Series X is very powerful. It's a very well thought out machine. Microsoft did good with the engineering of this. It's a well designed APU. The sheer density of this thing, once again, 360 mm squared, severed in M, and about 15 billion transistors is impressive. Microsoft's decisions here closely match, though, what I expected prior to the event. Throw lots of parallel computing performance at a problem, and allow developers to go ham, and choose how they would allocate resources such as GPU or CPU budget. Microsoft freely admit that technology such as ray tracing is just going to be one tool in the arsenal of developers, and this will accompany traditional rendering technology, aka hybrid rendering. I suspect, and this is without insider information on this, that certain games though will push path tracing. We've already seen it, for example, with Minecraft, but I suspect that indie games will push this. It could be very interesting from gameplay mechanics simply because of what hardware-based ray tracing can bring to the table. I would also bet that I'll get a ton of messages still asking me, well, what does all of this mean? How does the Xbox Series X compare to the PlayStation 5? And honestly, I'm still waiting, as of the time I'm recording this, for the full breakdown of the PS5 architecture. But from what Cerny has officially revealed, and also reading tons of interviews with developers, plus also what I've personally been told under the table, and if you've been following along with the channel, you'll know that a lot of my information has been very accurate for the PS5. I leaked, for example, how the PS5 would be revealed from Sony. I went over various aspects of the geometry engine, tons of other stuff, and all of that has turned out to be accurate. So... From what my understanding is, I kind of get an understanding of the PS5, but not deep enough to do a full breakdown analysis of the APU. With that said, I want to cover this more extensively in the future, but so far my opinion of either machine has not really changed. The Xbox Series X is very, very powerful. It's monstrous, honestly. And in terms of raw parallel performance, it's just incredible. Sony's machine is designed for raw throughput, and I know those two approaches may sound the same, but believe me, they are very different. Ultimately, for the average game which doesn't push either console to its limits, which console performs the best? <laughs> Honestly, it's probably going to depend on the lead development system, what the game engine was used, and of course, developer talent. But, if a game fully leverages the platforms, both games' consoles will essentially get their own positives and negatives, and there will definitely be somewhat a unique look for Xbox and PlayStation games. But, as I said, I'll go much deeper into this in a future video. With that said, thank you very much for watching. Hopefully, you'll join me for part two, and I'll see you soon. Oh, and once again, this is also an article, so you can check it out. You can, of course, subscribe, which would help a ton. And drop a like on the video and share it with your friends if you would so desire. With that said, take care of yourselves. Bye for now.